Good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, thanks for being here so early on the first day. You need to deserve a gold star for that one. Um, before we start, I just wanted to let you know that we are going to open up to questions at the end. We're going to do that live. We're not going to bother with the app for the session. So we have um, people with microphones, so we will have some questions at the end of the session. Also, little brown boxes that I see some of you are already playing with. Keep those safe. Maybe put them under your seat just for uh, for now. We will get to those in just a bit. Um, so um, we have an expert expert panel of um, digital creatives, including YouTube's head of EMEA Originals, Luke Hyams. Uh, and we're going to explore what YouTube Originals have launched in the UK today. Also, how YouTube differs from other streaming services and the priorities and the focus for the future of YouTube when it comes to supporting British creative talent and production production houses. Uh, we're also going to be joined, and we are joined, by YouTube creator Jessica kelgan Fozard here, writer and uh, broadcaster Rick Edwards at the end, and Geoff Wilson, who is executive producer from Remarkable, who are all going to talk about specific shows that they are making with uh, YouTube. Look, first of all, I can start with you. And just to get an idea of YouTube Originals current state of affairs and your priorities and what you're looking for and where you're looking to go in the future. Um, well, uh, yes, well, thank you, Edith, for coming and hosting our panel. Thank you so much for everyone making the journey to be here with us this morning. Um, in terms of where we're at, it's an incredibly um, exciting time to be commissioning at YouTube. Um, we are, um, we've had a little bit of a transition in terms of we are now producing shows that are going to live on the free side of the paywall, so we have the opportunity to reach the two billion people that log onto YouTube every single month worldwide. We're also adapting our premium service. So when we release a series, uh, you can see the first episode on day one uh, free, but then if you really like what you see in that first series, you can join premium and you can see the whole rest of the series on that same day. So it's a way of sort of making the premium subscription thing not stand in the way of the whole world seeing the shows. Um, in terms of like what we're actually commissioning, what we're looking to do, really like the sort of cryptic but on the nose term is we're looking for the stories and the formats that could only work on YouTube or only be told on YouTube. Um, we feel like really what we need to be doing is um, taking the things that already work on YouTube, thank you very much, and, <laughs> it, and it's extrapolating on them in the way that we can, as originals, help to take them to the next level. Yes. And, um, they're really happy about that one. I know, right? They love that one. And, and, and beyond that, I think, you know, the key thing that we've learned is, you know, YouTube is something different for every single person in this room, you know. Um, and to just broadly commission for YouTube is like, you know, because everyone's viewing experience on YouTube is completely different. Mm. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to, you know, really tap into some of the um, kind of more than trends or viewing habits. We wanted to, to tap into some of the sort of interests that everybody share, um, the big globally shared interests that we could then program around, you know, the big kind of viewing habits, essentially. And with that, in terms of making something, you know, specific for, for YouTube, where it has that potential to be something really interesting and really different. That's about taking risks, isn't it? And that's about giving people the chance to pursue something that no one else might well give them the opportunity to do. Definitely, and it's kind of interesting because so much of what the platform is already with the creators, um, you know, is, is that they are just taking risks. They're saying, look, I don't need the gatekeeper anymore. I can just grab my phone, grab my camera, um, go to a chicken shop, start to interview people, um, and then you know have a great successful series off, off the back of that. So um, yeah, it is about taking risks. And for us, it's just really exciting to find people that we can partner with and kind of big shared themes that we can commission into. And talking about those themes today, the three shows that we're going to be specifically looking at that you've commissioned, they have a connective thread that's an important element for you. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that we figured when we were sort of working out, you know, like how do we commission as YouTube for YouTube audiences is YouTube is a place for curiosity. <laughs> like it is a place where if, if I want to know more about a given subject or thing, I go to YouTube, I find a video, I learn about that. And I think that is just a really strong kind of 
um, element to the platform that we felt was a really good thing that we could harness onto to actually commission some shows that kind of fed into that sort of activity. So I wanted to show a clip really of the wider picture of uh, learning on YouTube and why we thought it was important to commission some original shows in that genre. Thanks. <laughs> It's, and it's a, but it's about taking that step further, really, isn't it, as well, in terms of that Absolutely. learning and education? Uh, yeah, it is. The, YouTube is the place for, you know, self-motivated learning. Um, you know, someone like myself who left school when I was 14 years old, uh, have, has, I've learned a lot more from YouTube than I have done from anywhere else in the intervening years since I first last went through my school gates. So I think, you know, just building on that and thinking about, you know, collaborating with some of the creators and the channels that are doing really interesting stuff and not talking down to the audience, you know, mm. and just because it's YouTubers and YouTube creators, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have a less intelligent audience than anybody else or because they're young that they are less intelligent. We found that, like with the first show we're going to talk about today, which is called The School of Dot Dot Dot, it's a collaboration between the School of Life channel on YouTube, which has 4.7 million um, subscribers, is a philosophy channel that mainly has big fans, that mainly has like um, animated videos about philosophy. We wanted to have an experiment of what would happen if we took that channel and mixed it with um, eight different, really unique, diff uh, diverse YouTube creators but, and put them together and, and matched each one of the creators with a specific question um, that they, like a philosophical question that they could go on a field trip to then explore. And so, um, you know, we uh, delved into questions like, is democracy dangerous? Um, and should I marry someone I don't love? And um, we went into a lot of other subjects like anxiety and identity. And, and actually one of my favorite episodes uh, featured Jessica, who's here today. And, and she um, investigated the concept of happiness and, and whether or not we deserve to be happy. Will we be happy? And how, what is happiness to young people today? Before we uh, take a look at, at, at what you've been working on, Jessica, can, for people in the audience who maybe aren't aware of your, your history with YouTube and your fantastic presence and what you do, please can you give us a little bit of background into, into what you've been doing for the past few years? Sure, well, I've been doing YouTube for the last three years. My channel focuses on uh, making sort of funny but educational videos that are about chronic illness, disabilities, and LGBTQ plus things. And I started it because I have two genetic disabilities and they weren't diagnosed until I was 17 when I paralyzed both of my arms for a year and a half. Um, part of it is that I paralyze bits of me at any time for any length of time and to any degree and I don't know to what degree they'll ever come back or even if they will. So I kind of live with that constant uncertainty. And then other symptoms are things like chronic pain, chronic fatigue, deafness, so I have a lovely interpreter, um, and blind in one eye, all of this kind of stuff. But when I was 17, I also had a lumbar puncture in hospital where they take spinal fluid from around your spine to have a test to see if I have meningitis. And it unfortunately went wrong and the spinal fluid all bled out and I managed to dehydrate part of my brain, gave myself brain damage, which is not advisable, <laughs> never good. And unfortunately, because of that, I had to spend two years on bed rest, lying in a dark room with absolutely no light, no sound, and even touch brought me excruciating pain. And when you spent two years just by yourself, you get to know yourself really well. <laughs> and I had to keep myself occupied. So I'd make up these little movies and TV shows in my head. And I do things like play an episode to myself on Monday and be like, no, wait, can't watch the next episode until next Monday. <laughs> Gotta keep the suspense. Gotta keep me something to keep going for. And part of my thing, I was lying there and I didn't know if I had a future. I didn't know that I was gonna get better. I'd never seen anyone in any traditional media who was living with a chronic illness or even a disability that related to mine. And as I lay there, I thought, I can't give up because I know that there are other people out there who are in the same position as me, who are lying in a dark room as well. And they need someone too. They need someone that they can look up to. So I thought, well, I'm just gonna have to be that person. When I get better, or even if I don't get better, and I'm not, fully better, I'm not exactly what we might call healthy, uh, I knew that I had to do that. I had to educate people, I had to spread the message that 
even if your life doesn't fit the norms, it can still be fabulous <laughs> and you can have a lot of fun. You can fall in love, get married and do wonderful things. And so that's what my channel is really about. But not everyone who watches my channel actually has a disability. Um, that's one thing I really love. It's also able-bodied people, mainly young people who want to learn about what other lives are like. Mm. And that's my absolute favorite thing about YouTube is experiencing other lives firsthand. How did you get involved in to be part of, of this specific show, the School of Dot Dot Dot? Uh, I think I was giving a talk at a university and Luke was there and was like, that's great. You seem really happy. How? I was like, oh, good question. Uh, honestly, <laughs> good it question. Was, uh, happiness was uh, probably the hardest episode for us to find the right creator to address until I met Jessica and just heard about her story, got to talk to her, understood her attitude, watched some videos and I was like, ooh, actually this could be, this could be great. And what did you want to... What did you want to achieve with it? And then how did you approach covering the subject and, and talking to your audience? Well, obviously it's a massive topic. <laughs> um, and one of the things I get asked quite often by my audience is that saying, how are you so happy? Like, that you're not working. How are you okay with this? And I'm like, well, don't you just have to be, right? Don't we all have to be happy? Um, I think happiness is an active choice. And that's what I try and help my viewers to understand mm -hmm. is that because you're sad, don't, don't go and watch a sad film, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe uh, we're going to watch a happy <clears throat> film. Maybe we're going to try and concentrate on the really good things and how we can also do positive things to make a positive change. OK, we're going to take a look at the show right now. Worth mentioning the show, the series was created um, in association with the School of Life and Acme. Anyone from Acme here today? Oh dear. Never mind. Um, but Shame. Yeah, never mind. Shame. <laughs> I wanted to give them a shout out, but never mind. So yes, yeah, so that's the School of. And what, what, talk to me a little bit about um, your expectations of, of collaborating on the show and, and what the reality of that was, of making the show. Uh, that was my first time seeing some clips, by the way. Oh, really? Oh, good. So that's very exciting. Oh, good. Um, I, one thing that I really struggle with as a YouTuber is being able to actually film myself, which is not good if you're a YouTuber, <laughs> that's your job. Um, particularly because like I have hand palsies, I can't lift heavy equipment, blah, blah, blah. So I found it really amazing, um, incredibly helpful, so refreshing to be working with other people and not have to worry about that. <laughs> so I could just think about the content and what we were actually talking about in the subject matter. Mm. And it was a really amazing collaborative experience because they kind of sent me a list of things and they're like, so we need your 10 tips for happiness, Jessica, go. And I was like, well, uh, hmm, okay, sure, sure, sure. And so together we managed to come up with some and expand on them. So they're not just things that apply to me and to my life, mm -hmm. but also things that can help other people out. Yeah. Well, it's a really interesting way to approach the subject of mental health issues, you know, in terms of, of happiness and how it's, it fits in with that whole discussion. Yeah. I think, unfortunately, we don't talk enough about, I mean, obviously, we don't talk enough about mental health at all, mm -hmm. but I don't think we talk enough about mental health as a side effect of other things like having physical disabilities or going through periods of illness or even just having an educational upset, an educational bump in the road, mm. you can have very bad knock-on effects. Mm. Um, and I think that this happiness uh, episode really focuses on some things that you can actually put into practice and actually do to help safeguard your mental health. Mm. And, and that is actually one of the main things we look for when we're commissioning shows that have a kind of edifying angle what is the distinct takeaway that you can get from watching this piece of video? And it's also the idea as well that subjects that are kind of, that are either skirted around or are maybe avoided. And, and history is another subject as well that kind of you go, how do you make history interesting? How do you get young people to engage in history? And Well, I mean, and, and really the, the, the answer to that is everybody sat down, they picked up their box, they thought there was going to be some wine gums and some chocolate <laughs> in there. So YouTube is giving them a snack, but actually... Um, they have the, 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 you in your hands have the basis of a time machine, you know, and that's, that's the thing to look at history in a really different way. We never went out into the world and were like, oh, we got to find a, a, a show that looks at history. Um, and 
I don't know if anyone in the room has done any commissioning in the last few years, but a lot of shows come across the desk that have some kind of a virtual reality utilizing element. And a lot of those shows go straight across the desk and down into the waste paper bin. But um, we found a really great one that came through um, Joff. Say hi, Joff. Hi. Um, which was this show called Virtually History that actually um, allows you to have an immersive experience where you travel more or less back in time or the closest thing to time travel possible by through these um, through creating uh, enormous computer graphic environments and then and then venturing into them. Geoff, I think you can explain it a lot better than I can. Um, let's hope so. Um, so, <laughs> so, um, so, 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 we, so, so we started. We, um, we've been looking for new ways to, to look at history and and all kinds of things, and and um, we've been particularly looking at um, using visual effects for that, um, and by how you can create a completely immersive world that you can actually get into in with virtual reality headsets, but also you can composite people into those worlds, so it's just as amazing mm. for viewers who are just watching in 2D, which is what most people are doing. Um, so we were looking at how we could do that, and we started looking at photographs. And through photographs, we were thinking, right, well, there's a photograph. You know, It's from a historical event or a historical place. If we could build up a map of what was around that photograph, we could actually allow people to step into it. And, and by, by creating that world, and you're right, we, we did create a time machine in Shepherd's Bush. And it was a very glamorous place to make it. Um, and, um, and so we then came to YouTube with, um, with an idea of how about stepping, allowing people to step into history and then having an emotional response to it and, and telling periods of history through that. And it was for, through talking to Luke that we touched on why don't we um, relate that to historical events. And, um, and through working with YouTube, we decided we would commemorate a global event, which was the Berlin, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, so we um, found uh, people who had a connection with the Berlin Wall, and um, particularly a relative who was pictured, uh, featured in a photograph from a key moment. So we found three periods of history, we, which was the, 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 riot, the creation of the Berlin Wall, an escape story in the middle, and then the fall of the Berlin Wall. And through some lots and lots of research, we managed to in, actually find, locate who those people were, wow. and then find their relatives. So we weren't taking the people who were in the, in the photo back in time, we were taking their grandchildren or their, you know, the, 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 the young people who didn't actually know anything about that history. And, and that's how it all started. And so where are you with it, with it now? Because the great thing about today is these are three different shows that are in different stages of, of kind of production, but where are you guys with it at the minute? So we've shot it all. Yeah. We, um, we, well, the first thing we did is built the world. Yeah. And you know, with, you know, thanks to working with YouTube, we were able to build quite a bit of Berlin, but also in different periods. So we first had to decide how much of Berlin we were going to build in 4K, which is ridiculously detailed and huge. Hmm. So we, and it was all incredibly, we, all, we had to make it historically accurate. So, you know, the street had to look right, the people had to look like, the cars had to look right. And um, with this, the, the Google VR thing, the cardboard, we're giving people, uh, viewers, an opportunity to go into that world and look around it in 360. So we couldn't just create a small corner yeah. of it. We had to create it in, in 360 dimensions. So um, we created that world. Then we had to put people into the world. So those were the relatives. So we had to cast relatives of, 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 these, of the, the contributors, find people who looked exactly like them, and then we took them to 360 scanning studios and where 164 photos were taken of them at one point to actually mimic the, the, what they look like in the photo. And then that allows us to put them in the world and the, the contributor actually to walk around their, their relative. Mm -hmm. So we've done that, we've edited it with a lot of green screen, and now we're slowly trying to churn out graphics to deliver the show. Um, but it's an exciting stage. Really exciting. We, we actually have a small clip, very, very small clip. Yeah. So it's working all the hours, but... It takes six minutes to render each frame. <laughs> so, um, so... What have we got today then? About 28 seconds. Okay. <laughs> I'm excited to see a little of this. <laughs> Uh, 
I think we can safely say that anybody coming to the YouTube session today would never have predicted that you'd see a clip of a computer-generated man in a basement with his shirt off <laughs> as one of the main things we're showing. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a great opportunity to take us into a, um, a new world. And, and really, the immersive thing is exciting. You can watch the whole show and see the contributors and some YouTube guests go through this as an adventure. And then you can go through the three... Um, 360 experiences yourself just through YouTube because those videos are uploaded to YouTube as well. So that's really exciting. We wanted to give everybody cardboard so when the show comes out in November, we also wanted to provide a little teaser of what you could expect. I know some people have already stuck it to their face, scanned the QR code. The little hint of what the show uh, will be is, um, how can we put this? It's, it's only a little tiny glimpse and is very different from what it will actually end up in terms of rendering and in terms of situation. What we do is we offer you to have a moment at the bottom of a hole in a tunnel underneath Berlin that people would use to go from east to west. When I put it on yesterday, I felt like I was in that scene from Silence of the Lambs where I'm being told to put the, the lotion basket. on my Lotion skin. in the basket. Yeah, exactly, yeah. lotion <laughs> in the basket. So it's a little bit weird. So just approach with caution on that. But it is this incredible tunnel, and in November, I'm guaranteed by my friend Joff here that you will be able to crawl through that tunnel, a rat is gonna run through, and um, you'll have narration, and it's gonna be great. Yeah, it's gonna be great. And that, story, that tunnel is basically the story of um, what you saw in that clip was um, a, a, a student and his mates basically dug a tunnel in 1964, a 145 meter long tunnel, 12 meters underground. Um, which was, you know, um, raided by the Stasi, and, you know, the most ridiculous story. Um, and they actually got 57 people out um, from, from the east into the west. And that young guy, that was his grandson. And he just had, that photo is quite famous. And he had seen that photo, but didn't know the significance. Wow. And he was really moved by it. But also the YouTubers that we put in, which was a really great response. Every YouTuber had some kind of connection to being displaced or um, some, kind, some kind of experience that related to the Berlin Wall in some way. Mm -hmm. And what was really exciting was putting those YouTubers in and they became commentators on kind of the world today yeah. and reflecting on what it must have been like. And when you saw that, that the scene outside, that was uh, the death strip, which is a 90, 90 mile long um, strip full of um, watchtowers, 500 um, mm. guards, 5,000 dogs that was patrolled and people were killed in it up to 1987. And you know, some of these, the, the young people were born around that time. And it was really interesting hearing them, you know, having stood in there and you get when you're in, when you're in there, you get the scale of it. Yeah. Um, they were really moved by it and related it to, you know, the world today and uh, putting up a borders and, and, mm. and all of that. And, uh, and that was a really powerful response that it, I think it, we, we were all thrilled with. Absolutely. You know, it, it, so many of the YouTubers and the audience who are going to watch this were born long after the wall came down. But we feel like watching this show there are, it is timely, there are parallels with things that are going on right now in the world. Um, you know, and one of the, like, the last lines of the, of, the, of the special is one of the YouTubers saying, you know, maybe we should think twice about building governments who want to build walls. Um, and so, yeah, so it's very interesting, lots of connections to today. Is that an important thing for you as a commissioner? For, the, for there to be, you know, kind of substance to, yes. to, to these programs? I, I think we have to have the reason why. Like, we can do lots of stuff for fun, but I think right now where we are in the world and where we are, where YouTube is in terms of the entertainment, if we're going to invest in things, we have to be able to look ourselves in the eye and go, you know, this is, this is the reason why, this is why we're passionate about this. This is a, um, a sort of, you know, message we want to put out there or a conversation we want to start. And with regards to the technology, kind of from both of you, Geoff, was the technology already there? Uh, did you have to develop it for the show? Um, we, uh, we've been working on that technology for a little while, but we just never done it on this scale. <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, we were shooting an enormous green screen, yeah. you know, to get, like, to get, you know, you're recreating drone shots of people walking down that death strip and you need to be in a green screen studio but get the camera 60 foot away. Yeah. And at one stage we had a jib in the car park that didn't actually belong to the studio oh, wow. because we had to get the camera far enough away to be able to make them as small as we wanted them to be. And then just before we move on to Rick, with regards to VR, you know, you talked about how it kind of slides off the desk and straight into the bin. What was it and why did you want to engage in, in commissioning something that had that element of technology attached to it? I just felt there was like a certain emotional resonance mm. to the idea of, you know, being able to go back and see 
uh, you know, into the world of a family member. Yeah. Um, and I felt like, you know, when we're looking for stuff that feels like it could only happen on YouTube, to have a show that has those two kind of components that you could probably couldn't get on a lot of other streamers because they don't have the 360 technology or lots of lovely cardboard headsets to give out at, at Edinburgh. You know, that, that's why one of the reasons I thought it would be a really good one for us. Also, because it kind of like, it feels like it's a new type of immersive documentary. You know, yeah. I feel it would be the start of something really big. Um, Rick Edwards, hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I love your podcast. Um, oh, thanks. And um, it makes science really fun and interesting. Thanks for that. No um, problem. Um, the, Someone's I'm, got to. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm, but this is, a, a, again, another subject that you wouldn't necessarily assume and predict that YouTube would invest in or commission the idea of well, looking at science. Well, I mean, I would disagree with that, Good. I think. Uh, <laughs> because um, I, I love science. Uh, I did a science degree for years. Uh, I've been sort of wanting to do science programming and uh, haven't really been able to because people are like, no, you're the geezer off Tool Academy. And uh, <laughs> so I started doing uh, a science podcast with my sort of science husband, Dr. Michael Brooks, very smart uh, quantum physicist. And our idea was we just wanted to do something that captured the genuine sort of uh, childish excitement that we get from science. <laughs> and we do it through the prism of popular culture. So we ask questions off the back of uh, a film or a, or a book or whatever, and then explore the kind of current science. Uh, and it really and, and it really worked. And we loved doing it. Uh, and it was interesting because it brought in a lot of um, uh, listeners, I think, who wouldn't listen necessarily to a science podcast, but they kind of liked the way that we we did it. And that was quite encouraging. Um, and, and also, it's a kind of uh, like, as someone who loves science, I don't watch that much science programming on regular telly. Um, I, do, I don't really feel like it captures that excitement for me, for me personally. Whereas on YouTube, there's loads of great science content. Like it, it's, there's, there's hundreds of people doing really, really great stuff. It's where I get all of my science from. And exactly as Luke was saying right at the start of the session, uh, if I think to myself, oh, I want to find out something about this, I go to YouTube uh, and there will definitely be someone going into great detail. Uh, and again, this thing of um, there's no element of, of patronizing the audience. Like some of the stuff is hard. You can see some really like hard maths as well, which is something else I enjoy. Um, <laughs> not, that's not for everyone, um, but, but it's out there. So in fact, um, doing a, a science show for, for YouTube feels like a very natural thing to me and I'm really excited that we've we've been talking about it for a while and, and, it, and it's it's happening I should say uh, it, it's happening rather than it's happened like we literally haven't shot anything yet we start on Sunday uh, and we don't we don't know what we're going to be able to do so we try to do some quite ambitious stuff you know that it's called the edge of science yes and yeah. what is it about uh, so uh, it, it, it comes from the fact that um, you have this idea I think generally in, in science of, of, of consensus. And everyone goes along with consensus because that's the idea of consensus. Um, but the novelty never emerges from that. And so every um, great scientist you can think of at some point has been written off as being a crackpot. Um, so Copernicus, <laughs> Galileo, uh, a guy called Einstein, might have heard of him. Uh, he, yeah, he was working as a patent clerk. He was developing the special theory of relativity. People thought he was Codswallop. Um, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, Rosalind Franklin, um, all of these people at the time were written off. And there's an amazing quote from, um, I think it's attributed to Schopenhauer. I don't think he actually said it. That doesn't matter. Um, he said, in terms of scientific advance, uh, first, uh, it's, it's ridiculed. Second, it's violently opposed. And third, uh, it's taken as being self-evident. That's the way it always proceeds. So the people, the people you should be interested in are the people you think are crackpots. Um, and so that's the idea of the show. We want to go out and meet the people who are on the fringes, uh, on the edge of science, doing stuff that everyone else in the scientific community is like, <laughs> I don't think so. Um, <laughs> and so we're meeting these people and asking them what they're doing and how they're getting on. Um, and so for the first episode, we're looking at people who are trying to levitate. Yes. Um, and uh, so that's why we don't quite, so we're talking to various <laughs> teams of scientists at the moment uh, about exactly, like, we want to levitate me, that's the aim. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of me for starters, which is not helpful. Um, so we're talking to a couple of teams, one team in, in the Netherlands, one team in Germany, 
uh, about exactly what we're going to be able to build to do and we're getting to build stuff for us at the moment and it's very exciting uh, we're literally running the numbers um, I'm on a diet and we're gonna and we're gonna see what happens <laughs> time travel uh, time travel interest yeah when we mentioned time travel uh, the laws of physics say time travel forwards is possible time travel backwards unfortunately not sorry I'm sorry it's not my fault that's just the laws of physics what other they, I'm just really sorry, geeking out by this. What other yeah. things are you excited about exploring? Uh, I mean, there's there's so much stuff. This is the thing because having done the podcast now for um, four years, uh, I'm done. I don't know, like 80 episodes. There is always stuff going on that that makes you just sort of go, "What the fuck?" Um, and those are the things that we want to we want to explore. So we want to look at um, invisibility cloaks, probably because they're they're sort of being developed. And to be fair, there are some animals that have some pretty good uh, stuff going on that we could we could <laughs> learn from. So we'll probably try and do that. Um, I think we'll probably um, look at uh, uh, regenerating uh, limbs uh, at some point, sort of Deadpool style, because um, there's a guy at Tufts University who's, who's working on that and he thinks that that could happen wow. uh, in the next few years. So we'd like to uh, hop on that. But I think the big thing for YouTube and, and for me is we don't want it to feel like uh, we're just sort of in, in a lab doing little things. Um, so we want to make sure that there's always visual scale yeah. um, to, to, the, to the things that we try and achieve at the end of, at the, end of the show. So, for example, uh, me levitating should do that, I think. Really hoping that happens. Yeah, me too. Really, really me too. I'm also slightly happens. scared. At one point, they used the phrase, loop the loop. And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Uh, with regards to um, commissioning then, Luke, and, and sort of what you're looking for as well, yeah. and guess that these are all kind of very different shows, but with the, like we say, with a kind of, with a thread through them, but but different lengths and that kind of thing. So yeah. there's no real structure of what it can be, really, is there? Well, there's structure of what we're looking for, but structure in terms of like, uh, you know, whether we have one shape or another, because there are no slots, mm. things are just out in free form we can afford to experiment and play around mm. with the form. And, you know, if, if we f have find something and it needs 38 minutes to tell the story, well then by gosh, we'll give it 38 minutes to tell the story. So yeah, we're, we're being really free with that. And I think that, you know, uh, it's still really important to us to do stuff with people who have um, created and, uh, you know, established popular YouTube channels, people who've in invested a bunch of time. One of the great things about the Edge of Science show is um, as much as we love Rick, it isn't just Rick. Rick is gonna team up with some of the best science and education creators um, you know, from all over YouTube to be both you know, with big subscriber counts and smaller subscriber mm -hmm. counts to be able to f have find the right people to help him do all of the crazy things that he's going to be doing and 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 is going to be well insured doing. So, <laughs> you know, so that's uh, that's the thing of you know spreading around, you know, working with a lot of different channels, seeing how we can mm. you know cross pollinate as much as possible. We're we're really interested in stuff that is is locally relevant that feels um, artistically forward thinking and that has some element of social impact. You know, we really want to make statements mm. um, and we want to do it creatively. And we also want to pioneer um, the way people are using the YouTube platform. You know, if there's a way that somebody comes to us with an idea of something that we could do to the site for the purpose of that program, which is something that all of the other millions of creators around the world could use in the future, then that gives me a good argument to go to the product guys and try to get that made for the show so um yeah so we we, we want to pu push things in a lot of different directions music is really important to us um and and talent you know in terms of of the stories we want to do we're we're you know the edge of science will feel like an authored show mm. you know it's much it's it's about rick on a journey meeting these people having these adventures rather than a sort of formatted thing top gear of science let's do this yeah. let's do that you know um and I think that's one of the things that really has to shine through, the personality of it. Like YouTube is built on personality. So I might say that again and again, but I really do believe it. So it's really important that that comes through in, in all the pitches. And when are these three shows going to be previewed? Um, these are coming out in October, November and December. December? Perfect. <laughs> no pressure, Mr. Levitation. I Bless hope you've you. got like a superhero suit ready for the I've actually got to go. <laughs> 
Um, we, need, we need to get your stunt <laughs> double, that's what we need. Um, we got some time for some questions. Um, if anybody in the room would like to ask any, uh, please raise your hands, don't be shy. I know it's early. I mean, I can go on. Seriously? Thank you. Here we go. God, it's a slow hand raise. Lady just there. And then one at the back, thank you. Hello. Thank you. Thanks so much to everyone. It's been so interesting um, and enlightening. I, I'm from the Wellcome Trust, so the world's biggest uh, medical charity in terms of research and science and across scientists. And we're, So this is delightful. Um, and a huge part of what we're doing at the moment is reaching <coughs> out to understand a bit more about how entertainment want to work with science. And I suppose that comes back across all the different subjects to different levels is how what's the process of how you decide who are you approaching what sorts of science or areas or learning you know how are you building that world is it architects you know what's the process once you have this huge idea of making that a reality what's the kind of system there well i think with all of these three shows they all just started with with you know producers that we wanted to work with coming to us with really good ideas that we felt could find an audience on YouTube or, or would be worth a, a punt. So, you know, um, it's not so much that we we sit down and we think, okay, we're definitely gonna go into a specific area of science. You know, um, next year we, we have got some specific things we're looking at. We're, we're gonna do sort of um, in the education space, you know, looking at ways that uh, education and sport can cross over next summer. Um, we're looking at art and education later in the year. I mean, those are some things that we're looking at as sort of broad um, areas of interest. Um, uh, women's health and, and education is another thing that we're looking at if, for next year in terms of learning. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's really, you know, it, it's more just who comes to us with great ideas. If there's producers out there that have something cooking that they feel, you know, they don't have to be a part of any of the three things I just mentioned. If they feel that they would work on YouTube and could find an audience, um, then by all means, get in touch and bring them in. And it goes for you guys at Welcome Trust as well. Do we have a question over there from someone? No? Okay, it's gentleman down the front. Yes, uh, is YouTube interested in any kind of scripted <coughs> entertainment programming at all? Well, we are interested in scripted entertainment in terms of stuff that feels like it could work on YouTube. It has a way that has a kind of um, sort of ideological or creative uh, fit for the platform, either in terms of the talent that's in it or the kind of uh, subject matter or the delivery, if it's something that has some kind of interactive angle to it. In terms of just broadly scripted stuff, we're, we're not really looking broadly for scripted material at the moment. Um, we are really feeling that the unscripted space is, is really exciting for us right now, particularly as there's just so much ability to cross over with what a lot of the really successful talent are doing themselves already on, on YouTube. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from them? There was a lady, there was a lady there. Was she? How long is it going to take from the idea to commissioning stage for the actual launch? Well, it was I don't know. quick. Yeah. So, so we, um, I think we first met, was it May? Yeah, yeah. Was, that, was it as late as May? Maybe April, but the best bit was we, the last meeting, the last meeting, we, we said, right, it's happening. And then you said, great, we've got ages till November 2020. Oh, whoops, yeah. And then okay. the lift, <laughs> I realised it was 2019. Yeah. So, so we suddenly had five months to make it rather yeah. than a year and five months. And it was also strange as well because we, we'd never met before we commissioned it. That, we'd only that ever was talked the on the phone. Thing. So that yeah. was a weird thing as well, but, you know. Um, it was quick. Yeah. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Focuses the mind. Either, <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions from our audience, please, here today, before we finish up? Oh, over there. How do your YouTube gauge the success of the show? Um, other than view count, we look at watch time as well, and we look at a show's ability to um, be successful on YouTube, but also to break out into the public consciousness. Uh, if it's something that people want to tweet about, uh, if you know, if there's that kind of, you know, if it creates some kind of social conversation, that is a measurement of success for us. Um, and you know, if if journalists write about it and say nice things, you know, just like everybody else, th that we look at as a measure of success. Um, 
but really it's it's yeah it's it, view count is important watch time is important and completion rate when we're dealing with series you know when you have something where somebody the average person a high percentage of people who watch the first episode watch all the way through to the end of the series you know you better recommission that and recommission it quick so um yeah those are the things we really look for which point do you recommission um recommission we start to have those kind of conversations when we've got six weeks of uh, data post-launch not to sound like a robot but i just think you know that's the sort of best time to really be able to take a sort of measured yeah. look you know six weeks from the last episode going live and so say for example something like wix program when will that how will that be released to the audience you know in terms of you talked earlier about the first episode will be free you know on premium yeah. platform and then but would that be then all available on for you know immediately yeah. is it something well it with um so yeah with, with with series like that exactly the way it will work is that kind of rollout of you know uh, well jessica's for instance is bi-weekly the first one uh when the first one is released all of them are released behind the paywall so if you're a member you can see them all mm -hmm. um but if you're not just wait patiently and bi-weekly they'll roll out and that's that's how we're going to approach series and our kind of paywall situation moving forward amazing and um, thank you so much for your time oh, today thank you um thank you so much for your questions please round of applause for Rex, Josh, Jessica. Rick, thank you thank you Jessica.